I love the slender threads, sometimes the very strong threads that bind all of what happens to us in our time together into a worshiping community. I want you to know that you have all these little parts and then the whole is created by no one less than the true and living God. And we thank God for each part. And none of it is important if others are not there to also receive so that the receiving giving cycle is a part of the whole life of the faith. I have kind of an inspiration from the Lord and I don't know who this belongs to or who it might be for. Maybe it's for me. But I feel pretty strongly led, so I want you to listen to this. If you're worried about sin or someone else's sin, worry about your own and let God deal with the others. I don't know that that's even relevant except for the fact that I have that pretty strongly in my heart. I find it pretty easy to point my finger at other people and forget about the work that God has to do with me. Let's pray. God, join us now as the word is read and preached. Help us to understand the wonderful, powerful reality of your presence in the living of our days. For Jesus' sake, amen. This psalm is so well known on the back of the bulletin, I invite you to share it with me, if you will, those of you who would like to do so. We'll read it as a a responsive reading altogether. I might say for those of you who are more time-oriented than many Wells people are, that I am preaching briefly this morning. Uh, But I'm going to preach until I'm done. So uh, if you have to go, like some people do, just go quietly. But it really won't be very late. Let's share Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. I like to say this is the word of God for the people of God. And the word of God in sacrament will be offered to you at the communion station on the way out. It was consecrated earlier today. And our lay minister of the morning, Debbie, will make that sacrament available to any of you who would like to have it. Here's the bottom line. We are either a people who are thankful or we are a people who are not thankful. Thanks but no thanks. That's the way some people approach the whole business of living in our day and time. It's too much, it's too dark, it's too deep, it's too hard. It's too wrought through with challenge and difficulty. So, no thanks. And there are other people who, in spite of all things, no matter what, somehow or the other have an edge on being able to look and find ways to be thankful. There are people who invent little acts of praise, like getting up in the morning are being able to sleep at night or the blessing of hearing a siren and being compassionate as an ambulance passes by. It was a, an ambulance. Like a simple act of being able to let your body function as it was intended to function, digesting food or going to the bathroom. All of those things are not gross turnoffs. Those are extended reasons for thanksgiving which all too often we take for granted so it's important for us to remember this people be thankful find a way to be thankful as a people it's a choice that you make i hate to tell you that but whether you're going to be thankful whether you're going to be happy is not given to someone else nor is it their responsibility it is given only to you and i think many times we fall into this dangerous trap of thinking that we have to be made happy It's a dead-end street. What you need to do is to make your commitment to be happy so that you can make others that way. And since it's not always just the human thing to do, it depends on the present grace of God working with you so that it can be happy. People need to learn how not only to give thanksgiving but to be reasons for thanksgiving in the lives of others. 
And I love the way it says, all the earth. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. It seems to me that all creation sort of stands waiting to offer its act of praise. I think of Frederick Beekner, the great Presbyterian clergyman and writer, who said that if creation doesn't lift its voice in praise, then the rocks will cry out and the grass will lift its head in joyful adoration. People, give thanks. Earth and creation has a testimony too, and it will declare the truth of God in the midst of people. Here's another impression too. We're God-made, not self-made. That comes as real news to some people. As a matter of fact, I talked to a lot of folks that would say, we are not man-made at all. We are woman-made. <laughs> we still have some small role to play in that, although it seems to be diminishing as the years go by. But <laughs> The simple truth is that every act of conception is a divine entry into the human stream of experience. That the conception of a child is a holy moment, the conception of a life. We were talking earlier about, you know, when the new revised version of the Bible came out, people threw it away because they said that it was profane. You know why? Because in Luke chapter 2, it says, a young woman shall conceive. It used to say a virgin shall conceive. And then it said a young woman shall conceive because the word virgin meant young woman of marital age. Incidentally, they burned the King James Bible at the stake too because it was vulgar when it came out. Lots of people don't know that. But anyway, it's not there. It's a little later on when it says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will conceive a child, and you shall call his name Jesus. You remember the angel song. All life is divinely conceived, and therefore is to be treasured. But we are not self-made. We are God-made. Erasmus the old rusty theologian of another generation said that all self-made men and women are excellent examples of poor workmanship. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been there and we've done that and we've tried to make it as it ought to be without God and we can't and therefore we don't. Hold on to that. And then finally, we have reason for thanksgiving. We have divine reason for thanksgiving because somehow or the other in ways that we don't always see and don't always know and certainly can't always fit into neat little categories, God is distinctly present amongst God's people. God is still a kind of overarching providence and purpose that calls us to find and to move in ways that make a difference. God is not absent. God is with us. Tonight I'm going to be addressing a little bit about what it feels like when you're totally cut off. But God is very much with us. And sometimes we know it and sometimes we don't. And I want to close with this magnificent illustration of God with us. A little family in the Brooklyn area became widowed when they lost their mom and the daddy, Adam, Reichless, R-I-K-L-I-S, had a son named Joey. When Joey became 18 years of age, he decided to become his old man and do his own man and do his own thing. And so he took off and went to his dad. He said, I'm going to be hitting the world now, and for years I want to travel, seek and find the truth, and I need to let you know that I've had to get up, give up on our religion too. Now, this was a devout Jewish family. In fact, the daddy was one of the few survivors of the Holocaust. And the daddy said, please don't tell me that. And the son said, well, that's where I really am, and there's no sense in lying. And the daddy said, then you're not my son, and I want you out of our family and out of our lives and not to hear from you again. And the daddy uh, said that, and the son said, that's pretty much the same way I feel. And so he left. In a couple of years, he ended up in India. He was doing some spiritual experimentation there, and there's a lot of different opportunities for different religious experiences in many countries. India, rich with a diverse reality of religion. And while he was there, I met a girl named Sarah, and they became soulmates. They were really very much in love. They were soulmates. 
She was also a rebel against religion and had cast off all of the religion of her youth. Isn't that interesting? Soul mates to people who don't believe in, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> so they became close friends and they went from this particular guru to that one and spent some time there. Went into a restaurant, to a small restaurant in one of the towns and ran into an old chum, an old friend. That happens. And they were talking and the chum said to Joy, I'm so sorry about your daddy. And Joy said, what? He said, well, your dad died in April. You didn't know? He said, no, I didn't know. He's, There's no way for them to be in touch. Of course I didn't know, daddy. And he said, yeah. He said, I'm, I'm sorry. And so he began to deal with that. And then in about a week and a half, he said to his girlfriend, um, I'm going to Israel. And she said, what? I'm going to Israel. And she said, Why? And he said, because I have things to find. And she said, are you thinking about spiritual stuff? He said, I'm not sure. I think so. She said, then it's time for us to part ways because I'm not going with you. And so he hugged her and kissed her, and they made their farewells. And He was in Israel for about a month when he decided that he would go to the Wailing Wall Let me tell you a little something. It's very hard to be in Israel for a month and not go to the Wailing Wall because it's so central to the main part of Jerusalem. It's one of the few places where the first and second temple still actually exists in physical form. When he got there, he saw all the people praying and he asked one of the people standing by, there are a number of young religious persons out there that give you some prayers and some yarmulkes to cover your head. And he said, um, what do I need to do to pray? I said, well, you need to cover your head and you need to take these prayers and here's a pencil and here's a little piece of paper if you have any petitions. And he said, what do you do with the petitions? He said, you write on them and you place them in the cracks on the wall. You'll have a hard time finding a place to put them in the cracks on the wall because there's so many petitions, but I hope your prayer is meaningful. So he went and he prayed against the wall. He said he felt a kind of presence he had not felt before. And when his prayer was over, he wrote something on his little piece of paper, his little petition. And he literally looked for one hour before he could find a crack that wasn't so stuffed that he could add his petition to it. And so he was putting his little folded paper into this crack in the wall, and the paper that was in it fell out and fluttered to the earth. And he put his there... He was leaning against the wall, and he said he knew that it was wrong and that it was nosy, but for some reason he just wanted to read the little petition that had fallen to the earth. And he opened it up, and it said, My dear son, Joy. A long time ago when you left, I said things that I certainly didn't mean, and I've always loved you and want your forgiveness. I'm not crying just because of the glory of this. I'm crying because of the the note that we all need to get from the one who made us. It would take a miracle, the little note said, for you to ever find this. But then God still is the God of small and large miracles. Love, Dad. The story doesn't quite end there. He decided that he would look into some rabbinical studies. And so he went to a group of people that could give you some direction. And they said, you need a place to live. Yeah, some food to eat. Yeah, till I get a job. And so he lived there for a while. And so the mother came in, the wife of the rabbi. She said, you know, I'm a matchmaker. And he said, oh, yeah. She said, you're about of the age to get married, so it's time. And she said, I've got this wonderful girl. And he said, well, I'm not really, I, you know, I've had some, I've got this wonderful girl, all you need to do is meet her. And she's coming Thursday, I've already arranged her. <laughs> and you have to come too. <laughs> so on Thursday afternoon when they usually had tea, they went, and uh, they were in the kitchen, and she said, oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait for you to meet this girl. Walked into the little small living room, 
and there sat Sarah. The girl he said farewell to in India. What are you doing here, he said. What are you doing here, she said. I found God again, he said. Me too, said she. Thanks and no thanks. May we be filled with great thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. And if your cup's a little low, If you'll turn in the back of the hymnal, we'll sing a very brief song before we do the benediction. Fill my cup, Lord, which is number what? 641.